Like any great endeavor, it's like you take that first step and then you just keep going and keep going and keep going. And, you know, you hire an architect and he does some renderings of buildings and you think like, okay, yeah, I mean, let's try it. And then all of a sudden you hire a contractor and he starts building it out. And then one day after many, many months, you look at the building and you go, oh my God, yeah, that looks almost exactly like what we thought or different, but, you know, great. And it's shocking. Scratch Entrepreneur, true stories of remarkable people who dropped everything to turn an idea into a healthy, profitable business. Today on the program, we speak with Jeff Wislich, one of the owners of Cardinal Spirits, a local micro distillery in Bloomington, Indiana. Jeff and three co-owners truly started a cutting-edge business from scratch. They spawned the idea, fought against government regulations that literally banned what they wanted to do, conducted one of the highest-grossing crowdfunding campaigns in Indiana, and brought their vision to life in a modern-style building in the near west side district of Bloomington. Cardinal Spirits and, you know, a craft distillery in Bloomington started, you know, maybe for me, 2008 or nine. I was working a great job, but what I was doing, I really wasn't making anything. And I really started to realize I had a passion for making something with my hands. I really wanted to put something on a shelf or, you know, something I could point out and say, look, I made that. And my partner now, Adam, we were introduced um, through our wives. And, you know, we really shared a common interest in craft distilling and had a passion for making great flavors, making great spirits. And that's what really brought us together. So Jeff and Adam started getting together more often. Adam would share new ways to create interesting flavors of liquor. And Jeff would come up with ways to take Adam's ideas and build them into a robust business idea. They would talk about the art of distilling, which, for those of you who don't have a still hidden in the Kentucky woods, is as follows. Yeah, when you walk into the distillery, you usually see two types of metals, stainless steel and copper. Uh, right now, we're looking at some stainless steel fermenters. They're about 1,000 gallons. And from there, we can pump in some grape or grain, let it ferment for anywhere from three or four days to about a week. And come up with a, a really great product that we then need to distill. So, you know, the, the basic concept here is you bring in, in a fermentable sugar, you add yeast to it, the yeast then eat the sugar, convert it to alcohol, and we then, you know, distill it. So it starts with a combination of water and grapes or water and grain. The source liquid is combined with yeast and the yeast goes to work eating the sugars and converting them to alcohol, a process called fermentation. Left at that, you would essentially have beer or wine, but hard liquor takes the process to a whole different level using distillation. So the whole magic of distillation, the whole thing that we're doing here is just that alcohol evaporates at a lower temperature so at a, uh, 173 degrees as opposed to water which is you know over 200 closer to 210 you start getting those vapors so what you want to do is you know gently heat the solution those vapors start to evaporate and then you want to cool them collect them turn them back into a liquid just like in chemistry class you know liquid solids and gases and you capture that alcohol so unlike a brewery or a winery that might be okay with a, a solution that has 10% alcohol in it, you know, we're hard alcohol guys. We want to separate that water from the alcohol. So we'll take a fermenter that has 1,000 gallons in it of, let's say, grape to make our vodka. There'll be about 100 gallons of alcohol in it, and then we need to separate that out. We need to distill it. So we'll hook up a hose Hook it up to our still. We're looking at a beautiful column still. Uh, it's got a lot of copper on it. Copper has always been a part of distillation. Uh, you know, at first it was because it was uh, a metal that was able to be formed and molded, you know, without a lot of work. Then they found out that there's actually a purpose to it. It removes some sulfur from the uh, distillation. And then now it's because I think it's so pretty. Um, so people have always had uh, copper on their stills. Ours doesn't look like a traditional pot still. It's got a series of columns. We hook a hose up, 
We start the distillation process. It'll take us about 10 hours to go through 1,000 gallons. And at the end of it, we'll have, you know, 80 to 90 gallons of high-proof alcohol. Distillation, the process that creates hard alcohols like rum, vodka, whiskey, and gin, uses the basic premise that different liquids evaporate at different temperatures. Think about the last time you stuck your face over a boiling pot of water. Your face got all wet, right? That's evaporation, of course, but the cool thing is that if you stuck your face over the lower temperature boil of a copper still like the one at Cardinal Spirits, what evaporates would be the alcohol. Distillers have mastered the process of separating the concentrated alcohol from the other liquids that dilute it. So Adam and Jeff had recipes, business plans, and a vision to create a local micro distillery. There was just one obstacle. What they wanted to do was illegal. But in 2013, the Indiana State Legislature was considering a change that would make it legal to create spirits and sell them directly to consumers. Adam and Jeff knew this law would be the life or death blow for Cardinal Spirits And so Jeff used his high school forays into student government, a ton of research on laws in other states, and a lot of patience to become a real-life lobbyist for his cause. I joke that when you start a distillery, the last thing you actually get to do is distill. You know, doing lobbying, it was really, really funny and fun. I mean, it felt very much like middle school. You you go outside the uh, session in the chambers and you pass notes into your representative and you say like, yeah, I'm so-and-so representing Cardinal Spirits. I'd really, if you have a minute, I'd love to talk to you. And they come out into the hall and you got a few seconds to state your case and then they go back in and vote on things and basically standing in the lobby and actually lobbying. So it was quite a bit of fun, but also, you know, you never thought that to start a business, you'd have to, you know, have a lobby lobbyist or go up there and lobby so okay so i'm i'm your legislator and i i just came out of the you, you've been passing notes all day trying to get me to come out and i finally walk out I, and I, I say what is it that you what what is it that you need what's your pitch to me so at that time i would have said you know sir i'm jeff wuslich bloomington resident i'm starting a business there we're trying to start a distillery you have a bill in front of you that will govern craft distilleries and quite frankly as it stands now will make it very challenging for me to open my business myself and partners have already invested a number of thousands of dollars to get this going and we have a few tweaks on the bill that will make it possible for us to start our business they might say okay what's the bill number you know some questions do you have anybody helping you out at that time we had retain some uh, actual lobbyists, and I would, uh, depending if they were a Republican or a Democrat, point to one of the two people. They would look at said person, and they would say, Mike, Andy, and they would jump in and say, yep, this is House Bill, you know, so-and-so, whatever. Uh, It's been approved by so-and-so. You know, I think this is a pretty good vote. It was pretty quick. You had just a limited time. You had to make your point quick. You know, I wanted to express to them that you know, this was my business. I was really starting it. I had invested money and that what, as the bill stands, it was like, you know, pretty tough for us to get going. So the bill did pass. And for the most part, it passed the way Jeff had hoped for. But even the best version of that bill came with serious limitations. They really, really make you be a craft distiller. So what we sell here at the, at the birdhouse which is the front of the house for the distillery has to be made in the back of the house. So we can't bring in, you know, somebody else's rum or somebody else's whiskey or even a bottle of wine or beer and sell that here. We can only sell what we make. And that's a, that's a, that's probably a really good thing.
Cardinal Spirits knew their vision, and now they knew their limitations. It was gut check time, the moment where vision boards the train to reality. And at the point where so many others flounder, the founders of Cardinal Spirits achieved a feat envied by almost anyone who's ever envisioned a cutting-edge business. They raised $850,000 from 22 investors, purchased a beautiful copper still, built a distillery, fashioned it with a tasting room and front lounge, and opened it to the public. After many, many months, you look at the building, you go, oh my God, yeah, that looks almost exactly like what we thought, or different, but, you know, great. And it's shocking. I mean, you said about how we're sitting here looking around. I remember the first week that we opened, we had a lot of friends and family come in, and they visited. And then after we opened it up to the general public, I remember looking at the bar and like wondering, like, who are all these people? And like, why are you here? <laughs> you know, I was so excited that they were, but I was just like, how did you hear about us? Why are you here? And uh, they keep coming back, which is wonderful. So that brought us to the obvious next question. How did people hear about them? What was it that snowballed their business from the support of friends and family to bar seats and tables on their veranda filled with strangers? One thing, especially in a small town and a great town like Bloomington, a great way for us to build up our uh, relationships with people is to just say yes to all the uh, offers of donations and community involvement that we can. And the first year we said yes to almost just everything. That was kind of our default. You know, you want an auction item for your benefit to help, you know, this small animal? Yes. You know, you want... Um, a bartender to come and teach a class about something for your group that helps retired people find new jobs. Yes, we want to do that. You never know what's going to actually pop and be helpful for you, but we try to do it as much as we can. It's It's been a strategy that can be exhausting at times as a small business owner with limited staff and resources, but at the same time, it's the exact kind of business that Adam and I wanted to build and run and that we were, we were present. We just had our one-year anniversary, and a gentleman came in, and I gave him a tour. And at the end, you know, he, he said, "Now, how long have you been here?" And I said, "Oh, you know, this is this is our one-year anniversary. That's why we're doing these tours, and that's why there's cake and all these things." And he's like, "I can't believe you've only been here for a year." He said, "I think I feel like you've been here for a much much longer. I just feel like you've been a part of the community for a while." And I thought, "All right, that's great. That was like that was a really big compliment." And I didn't even know we were working towards that, but that does make me feel really good. I think for us, it, it makes both sense on what we want as a company and it makes us feel good. At the same time, as a tactical effort, you know, uh, the absolute guys or the, you know, Captain Morgan guys or whomever are not going to be showing up at these events and, you know, uh, meeting people. So that's our advantage. We can have a better ground game, I guess you'd call it, than they can. You know, they can they can own the airways and the print ads, but we can still compete on the ground game. Cardinal Spirits has found a way to attract customers by using new modern avenues like a social media presence, but what they've done that works the best is to simply be present. Say yes when asked for donations, show up and be awesome, and it works. Cardinal is everywhere around Bloomington. Every time an event comes around, the bar is stocked and staffed with Cardinal Spirits and Cardinal employees. With a model of saying yes, be present, and be awesome, Cardinal has created exponential growth in a very short period of time. The Cardinal growth, business model, and of course the creation of alcohol seem to have them on the same path as the booming microbrewery world. But Jeff offered some caution in making that comparison. You know, I think a lot of people are jumping into being a craft distiller because of what they saw happen in the craft brewing uh, industry. I think it's kind of a little bit of a, of a dangerous analogy because craft breweries, when they started in like you know, 80s when they started picking up steam in the 90s. You know, they're competing against Budweiser, Coors. And those beers are fine beers, but there's not a lot of taste in them. And a craft brewery 
starts putting in, you know, some wonderful hops and some really, you know, beautiful malts and they start producing like a delicious beer. Right. And so it's a very significant difference from a Bud Light. Now on the craft spirit side, uh, you know, the big guys that make spirits, the spirits are delicious. You know, I mean, there's great large companies making delicious spirits and they've got a good story and good marketing to back it up. I mean, if you go down to Kentucky, you can tour some beautiful facilities and, you know, there's not a lot of guys working there. They're using local water. They're using local grain. I mean, they're, they're good, uh, good companies, good spirits. So being a craft distiller isn't quite the same. You've got to really make a high quality product because you're competing against high quality products and you've got to be able to tell your story really well. And it's very expensive. And boy, I mean, like if you look at the shelves of a liquor store, I mean, you know, it's a huge long row of vodka. Like, how are you going to compete with making like a craft vodka? And we try to, and we do, but it's difficult. And, you know, whiskey is a challenge just for it's aging. So it's, if, you know, if you think, oh, you know, I saw a craft brewery, it, you know, started and, you know, 10 years later it got bought out or, you know, it blew up and it's been just going gangbusters. I'm not sure we're going to see that exact growth on the craft distilling side. I think it's going to be a little bit slower. Something about this realization makes Cardinal Spirits even more special. With heavy competition from more than worthy distillers who have national distribution channels, Jeff and his team know that they aren't in it for the quick, easy explosion or huge buyout. It's a labor of love. Love for local sourced ingredients, love for creativity, love for doing something that makes your community that much cooler, more interesting, and more fun. Yes, making money is important, but the core values are do what you love and love what you do. Which brought us to our last topic, something that I love. You know, whiskey is really hot right now, so you want to make whiskey, and you want to sell whiskey. So you make some whiskey, and you put it into a barrel. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you're hoping that it is good. And meanwhile, while you're waiting, you've already paid for the grain, you've paid for the water, you paid for the labor, and you've paid for the barrel, which, you know, the big ones are going for like 400 bucks these days. So your accountant is getting like super frustrated with you, right? Because, you know, your accountant wants you to turn your inventory in like 30 days. So, you know, here at Cardinal, we can make um, vodkas, gins, and, you know, liqueurs pretty quickly. You know, we can make those within, you know, a week or so. But the whiskey, you know, our first barrel came out that had been aged eight months, and that was about as young as I would have wanted to release it. You know, we saved some of those barrels that are going to go longer. You know, I think there's no perfect number for how long you want to age your whiskey. You know, the, the cheeky answer is you want to age it until it's ready. But that's not really like a fun answer, right? But, you know, a lot of people go at least a few years. You know, bourbon, you know, certainly people buy, you know, 15 and 20-year bourbons. But I think most of our stuff would be between like two and five years, you know, until maybe we expand and get a bigger facility and more cash flow. But, yeah, so whiskey, think, you know, anywhere from, you know, six months to, you know, five years for a craft distillery is pretty common. And then, you know, the other spirits can be turned around pretty quickly. Would it be called bourbon in Indiana because of our general location, or would Indiana get to make up its own name? Yeah, so it's a great question. It's always a good bar bet, too. Can you make bourbon outside of Kentucky? Like, always take that bet, and you will win. All bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. So there's lots of types of whiskey. So there's Irish whiskey. There's Canadian whiskey, there's, you know, an American whiskey, there's, you know, really popular scotch is a type of whiskey. So think of, think of whiskey as a large umbrella category. Bourbon is one part of that. So uh, bourbon, like some other spirits and wines, is, is regulated to a region like champagne or tequila, but that region is the entire United States. So... The rules for making uh, bourbon, bourbon has to be uh, at least 51% corn. They say mostly corn. It has to be aged in a new American oak barrel. Now, there is no age requirement, so you could really just let it touch the barrel and release it as a bourbon. Not many people would do that. 
You can only use the barrel once. It has to be a new barrel. So we assume, as we were talking about lobbying in the legislature, that the Coopers, uh, Cooperages back in the day wrote that into the law, right? So they would always have good work. Um, you know, a lot of those bourbon barrels go to Scotland or to other places to be reused. That's why bourbon is sometimes a little bit more expensive. And then it, when you're distilling it, you can't distill it above a certain proof. Otherwise, it becomes too neutral. So they want you to distill it um, to a proof where you get a lot of flavor in it. So those are the kind of the three requirements for bourbon. We make bourbon here. There's delicious bourbon made in Texas and Colorado and Oregon, um, certainly in Kentucky, but not just Kentucky. So. There's no doubt that business ownership in any industry has a tangle of rules and regulations to weave your way through, but there may not be any that tops distilling those tiny drops of fermented grapes and grains. Jeff, Adam, and all the Cardinal Spirits team have navigated them gracefully all the while creating something, something made by their hands that they can be proud to share with friends, family, and those strangers that just seem to keep sitting at their bar. Jeff today is face to face with Jeff in 2008. Yeah. And you can tell him anything you want about Cardinal Spirits. What would you say? What, what would you tell him? Wow. Um, that the people are the best part of Cardinal Spirits. Working with the different people is the best part. Uh, I would tell him raise more money as well. <laughs> and I would tell him to start putting whiskey down in 2008 so that it was ready in 2015. For sure. Awesome. Jeff, thank you so much for being willing to let us just like get a little picture into your world and just take an hour out of your time today and, and, and share your story with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great. Thanks so much for coming by. A special thanks to Jeff Whistlich for taking the time to share his story with us. If you frequent Bloomington, Indiana and haven't been to Cardinal Spirits, it's definitely time. Text that group of friends in your phone right now and make a date to meet at Cardinal, sit on their beautiful deck, and try one of their latest concoctions. You'll truly be glad that you did. If you enjoyed this podcast, there's a couple of things we need you to do right now. That is, right after you text your friends and set up a time to hang out at Cardinal. First, we need you to subscribe to Scratch Entrepreneur on iTunes so you can hear future episodes as soon as we release them. Once that's done, please share a link to this episode on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you get social. We truly appreciate your listening.